Life Podcast. I'm your host, B. Getz. This is episode number 23, coming at you live and direct from the Vibe Junkie Studios in Oakland, California. So grateful for your tuning in. Before we get started here on episode 23 of the Upful Life podcast, I wanted to take a moment and give thanks and show some love and shine a light on Backline. Uh, introducing Backline, the music industry's mental health and wellness resource hub. In the wake of several tragic losses in recent months, more than 50 music industry professionals have banded together to launch an industry-wide mental health support initiative, Backline. A hub for artists, industry professionals, and their families to quickly and easily access mental health and wellness resources. Backline has partnered with leading support organizations and care providers to streamline access to services, specifically geared towards the music industry. That includes the Sweet Relief Musicians Fund, Anders Osborne, Send Me a Friend, VA Way, and more. Uh, So this was put together uh, by... A number of individuals, including uh, CEO of Level One, Hillary Gleason, who was kind enough to be a guest on this very podcast, episode 20. Um, So this is uh, a new endeavor for her and a number of other uh, influential folks in and behind the scenes in the music business, not the least of which Miss Kendall Corso, formerly Kendall Deflin, uh, who until recently was the creative director at Live for Live Music and somebody I know and love and work with uh, for several years so with Hillary and Kendall in the mix you know it's going to be a worthwhile endeavor with intention and integrity uh, it also includes folks like their friend Tori Pitarelli as well as Ben Baruch, Nadia Pressure from Madison House, uh, Joshua Knight from the Paradigm Agency, Jay Sweet from the Newport Folk Festival and of course Peter Shapiro from Brooklyn Bowl and Lock-In and a number of others. So I wanted to take this week's thank you and offer a deep bow to Backline. You can check them out at backline.care. The website will start as a referral-based system where professionals will assess visitors' needs and lead them to appropriate resources. Backline's goal is to provide a network of on-demand mental health services available at no or low cost for industry professionals with a focus on addressing the unique challenges and stresses of our space. And I'll end with a quote from Hillary Gleason, uh, CEO of Level, the convening body behind the Backline Initiative. Quote, there are wonderful organizations who have been doing great work to support the health and wellness of the music industry. What we saw was a gap in making these resources easily accessible. Mental health treatment is not one size fits all, so it is our hope, but that by bringing these organizations together in one place and providing case managers to guide visitors through the resources, we can make it simple to get the help you need. End quote. So, yeah, with that, you're hearing uh, a little bit about Backline. So check them out at backline.care. And uh, in the background, you're hearing Circles Around the Sun from Pace Studios in New York City. The track is called On My Mind and uh, features the late, great Neil Casal 
whose tragic passing uh, at the end of the summer, no doubt, was a major cog in the wheel of bringing this initiative to fruition. So we'll hear a little bit more of Circles and then start the show. that earring is Episode 23 of the Up for Life podcast. Uh, I just wanted to shout out and large up uh, Smashletooth, our episode 22 featured guest. Really tremendous interview from Ashley that was very well received. Got a lot of wonderful feedback and it opened a lot of dialogue in the community. Brought some new listeners to the show. So a deep bow of gratitude to Smashletooth for uh, her appearance here on the Up for Life podcast. If you enjoy the show or want to reach me or comment in any way, feel free to email the show at b.gets at upfullife.com. That's B period G E T Z at upfullife, U P F U L L I F E dot com. I'm open to any suggestions for topics, possible guests, or if you just want to offer some constructive criticism or holler at me, please do so. You can also visit the Facebook page at backslash up full life and uh, iTunes reviews are welcome and appreciated. There's a bunch of really fantastic reviews on iTunes right now, but we're always looking for more. So I want to thank everyone for listening and we're going to move into our featured guest for episode 23, Mr. Ruben Sadowski from Goyaki Urba Mate. Um, you are listening to Jadena from his new album 85 to Africa the track is called Babouche and features Gold Link This is a song called Indigo Dance Episode 23's featured guest. It's an honor and a privilege to welcome Ruben Sadowski to the show. Ruben is a sebador with Goyaki Urbamate, with a role that finds him traveling all over the world and interacting with thousands of people, uh, bringing mate and uh, serving communities and aligning with different entities like the Permaculture Action Network and Rising Appalachia of which he served in the capacity uh, of their tour manager for a time. 
a story that he recalls with great joy and fondness. Um, we talk about a lot of stuff, and instead of giving you a whole rundown about what's to come, I'll just uh, ensure you that it's an engaging and diverse conversation, not only about his role with Goyaki and the work that they're doing around the world and back in their uh, land in Salt Spring Island in British Columbia, but also Ruben's uh, humble roots in Aspen, Colorado, and his prolific adventures in myriad of action sports including skiing of all kinds and surfing paragliding speed flying and beyond so he re relates a lot of gems and stories from those experiences and you know how they've empowered him to kind of just seek the flow state in each and every endeavor in his life so i found this interview to be quite inspiring and enlightening uh ruben happens to be one of the most interesting guys I've ever met. So I have to say move over Dos Iquis, dude. There's a new sheriff in town and his name is Ruben. And for the next 50 minutes or so, you'll hear why. Um, in the background, you're hearing Indigo Dance from Rising Appalachia live from Jazz Fest After Dark. One-Eyed Jacks on Sunday night, the second weekend of Jazz Fest this year. And uh, we talk a lot about Ruben and my crossing paths through the years from Envision to New Orleans to Burning Man and etc. So buckle up and pull up a chair and listen to Ruben Sadowski of Goyaki Arba Mate on episode 23 of the Up Full Life podcast and I'm your host, B. Getz. All right, let's do it. This is the Upful Life Podcast. I'm your host, B. Getz, and I'm here in uh, San Francisco, uh, sitting here with Ruben Sadowski. Pronounce the last name right? Yeah, totally. Awesome. Well, Ruben has been a friend of mine for several years now, and we counter each other at like all these amazing events. So we're coming to you live tonight from Planet Home, which is a first-time event here in San Francisco where uh, Ruben's here in the capacity with Goyaki Urbamate and their Come to Life program. So first things first, what exactly is Planet Home from your perspective? Uh, I think that w using their verbiage, it's a solutionary conference. So, you know, we get so much bad news about, you know, the very real things happening on the planet, but especially here in the Bay Area and, you know, throughout the world, there is a lot of good news. And it seems like we need to focus not only on the incoming problems, but on the solutions that we need to bring forth to overcome them. Rather than just focusing on the bad, it's about promoting the light. Well said, well said. And I noticed there's a concerted effort here, um, how would I say, to kind of place the onus on what we can do uh, instead of reactionary, pro proactive, and, and sort of uh, maybe frame things in a different light as, instead of this doomsday nature that seems like this era is full of the doomsday prophecies, which are likely true if you were to listen to Bill Nye a few minutes ago, pretty frightening stuff. But at the same time, even he, his message was positive. And uh, I thought that was really remarkable about Planet Home. It's not what I expected. Um, let's, and, and that's in a positive way. Yeah. Let's talk a little bit about what you're doing here. You're here with Goyaki or Bamate, and I want to talk all about the company and the come to life. But I just got out of this pod with headphones and this amazing program that I just watched. So what is that about, specifically, what you're doing here at, uh, at Planet Home? Well, so um, I'm here. I, I help run the marketing for Guayaki Yerba Mate. It's an amazing company. Been around for 23 years and probably one of the best examples of, you know, a, a truly regenerative business model, which you hear the word regeneration a lot right now, which is good. Um, to me, that means, you know, a system, a piece of land, a business, a person that not only is sustaining and taking care of themselves, but continuing to be able to do so. So it's taking sustainability to like thriving. And um, yeah, I'm really lucky. I get to, you know, the most simple version of what I do is I share mate. And uh, being a sharer of mate, being in service, is being a sebador. That's the name, that's the job title we all have. 
but um, it's of course many things more than that. We're making digital content. We're doing activations of our own all over the country. We're partnering with events. Um, we've got our own, you know, come to life as a media house. It's a good news network for the regenerative movement and the regenerative paradigm. And this is a really cool crossover because uh, my group, you know, which is mostly focusing on the Guayaquil marketing. Um, and works in tandem with uh, Come to Life, which started as Come to Life Music and is now Come to Life Media, which, as I said, is the regenerative good news network for the regenerative movement. And it's really focusing on musicians, artists, activists who can not only like spread the message of what we're doing in the rainforest, what we're up to with all the amazing things in the company, but we really like trust the artists, we trust the activists to be our guiding compass. And so we've made all these different at, uh, outlets where we can really like support their work. And that's a lot of what we do, you know, whether it's marketing activations is just amplifying all the amazing stuff that's going on. So here we've got our mate, it's really exciting. We're doing our mate cocktails for the first time, you know, really kind of coming into that nightlife scene because we are a, a health drink. We mostly right. focus on health and wellness, but we know that there's a huge section of the world and the population that likes to drink and likes to party. And so they should be drinking something that is good for them rather than something that's chemically and bad. And um, it's an exciting new avenue. So we're doing that. We're promoting, but also it's, you know, I do very little like branding, very little sponsorship. It's always in partnership and it's always with the pretty singular goal to just connect with people one on one you know it's for me it's less about like how many likes how many followers we get right. it's really about knowing like if i have a a connection with this person in front of me they are going to be a fan they're going to be an ambassador they are going to be a sebador in their own right sharing with their community in the way that's most authentic to them um, something we've added to kind of our roster of how we're showing up is we have one of our storytellers, Cyrus Sutton, has been working on like an immersive 360 experimental, na experimental nature film um, for the last couple of years. And now we have a dome which we can project it on. And the film is called I Am This. And we're able to actually like bring people 15 at a time and do an eight minute showing of this ever-evolving film project that um, sometimes is 20 minutes, 15, and it's been a super big hit. Yeah, I'd say. It seems like every time I come by the booth in the past couple of days, or the area, the dome, and the, uh, where you're serving the mate, there's just like a hub of activity. So you're activating in the dome with this awesome and kind of, you know, awesome in the dictionary sense of the word. Just what's being communicated in the film is, is powerful and like in line with kind of what Bill Nye was talking about with being just a spec. Yeah. And uh, it's really cool how that um, sort of transmitted to me coming right off the Bill Nye talk. And then you come out and then there's all these people kind of almost like a saloon standing around a bar, if yeah. you will, having conversations. And the, talk about activated. The conversations that I've had through the years at your mate stations have always been really charged. And I've learned a lot. It's where I met you. You know, you'd be pouring mate out in the middle of Playa next to Abraxas at Burning Man, and then you'd be doing the same thing in uh, a club in New Orleans, you know, yeah. with Rising Appalachia, which we'll get to, because that's how I first encountered you. And the Up For Life podcast is a big Rising Appalachia house. So um, I'm excited to talk to you about them. And there's the crossover there with Come To Life, because they're one of the flagship Come To Life artists. So yeah. I think you do amazing work. And uh, I just wanted to kind of tip my hat just to what you're doing here uh, is really uh, bringing a lot of good energy around. What do you, you don't call it a bar. So what do you, where do you drink mate? We, it's called a mateada. Um, and actually we have our first mateada, like brick and mortar place for people to come gather, have our nitro mate, which is not a product that's like sold in stores. It's just in a few locations where we bring it. And then on Salt Spring Island, where a few of our founders actually live and we have our summer gatherings and retreats on like a 180 acre farm where all the food is grown, you know, a year in advance for our gatherings. And then just down the road is the mateada. Mateada means like, uh almost like when you drink too much mate okay. but, or it's the sensation of when you are like literally high on mate I see yeah awesome so you, the first you, of many. 
you had the nitro brew at the burn a few years back if i recall like uh that when i saw you out at the braxis white procession i feel like yeah we the nitro is awesome because again like the rest of our marketing it's it's subtle it's sugar-free it's just three ingredients it's just mate water and nitrogen and then nitrogen actually like really change the little bubbles um when nitrogenated like change the flavor profile and so we're able to give people this really pure product without sugar i mean as all of our products are no preservatives anything like that and it really like the reaction we get is incredible yeah so it's been awesome you know birding man we're able to go out there and obviously no branding but right um, it's we connect with ten, twelve thousand people a year, and many more through all the other camps that have mate, and it's been an awesome like seed for all the other things that we've done. Yeah, I definitely want to talk some Burning Man stuff with you, um, and I really enjoyed your presence out there every time I've encountered you, with or without the mate. It's always it's always awesome. But uh, one last thing you mentioned about Salt Spring Island, because I've been tra- transfixed by some of like the films and some of the footage that you've shared through the Come to Life media. I would like to hear more just about what's going on there and like the retreat and, and in general, like what is the goal? I mean, part of the goal with those is like it's pretty unique to be a company where we're at where we still, you know, I know every single person's name in the company, we're a little bit over 100 people, and it may not always be that way, but for us to be able to meet at least once a year, we really, it's more like twice a year, like, we all just really like each other. Like, there's a, it's all love in our company, which is a pretty amazing thing, yeah. again, say, after 23 years. So just to get together, to really, like, foment all of our connections, to talk about our plans, our goals, to reflect upon, like, what worked what didn't and to do that in person and not in like through a powerpoint um is a powerful thing and and through that i mean the come to life project was actually born through an event called out of a jam it was done for the first time in new orleans eight or right when obama was elected um which was very joyous and then we did it during the 2016 election we had rising appalachia there Masayuko, Pia, um, a couple of our first artists. And, you know, it was a beautiful thing to be with these artists that we all love and respect and are, like, doing amazing activism work themselves and to just, like, see the strength in that when, like, you have a regenerative beverage product, a B Corporation, and these artists that people really connect with. And that was a hard night for everyone. There was a lot of tears. Sure. And we... You know, the next day, our founder, David Carr, and the people in the room just looked at each other. They were like, we, we're needed now more than ever. We need to, like, stand up. We need to stand together. And we need to tell a positive message that people can get behind because we're going to need a lot of hope in the years to come. And so from that, we've just been able to take on all kind of concerts, uh, action days. We work closely with like Permaculture Action Network. Right. Um, right now, actually, a lot of how we're showing up is we're doing like month-long campaigns with Come to Life, which, you know, is also what's cool about Come to Life is like Guayaquil's media and image is very health-focused. It's bright. It's happy. We work with actually over 1,200 university students who apply to us and our university ambassadors, we call them. And all we're, do- we're not giving them any instructions. It's not like an internship. It's just like, tell us how you want to support the cool stuff, the environmental, the social, just whatever's rad in your community. We'll give you product. We'll help you out. Some of those kids have become Guayaquil employees. Um, and so it's a bright, happy, cool message. Come to life with their media, they get to sometimes tell the the harder stories sometimes the darker stories you know we've done stuff in pine ridge we've done stuff with people who've like come through addiction we've uh worked with the anti-recidivism movement you know people just coming out of prison and it's not always a bright happy story but there's always a regenerative message to it like hey i went through this i made it through this challenge this is how it's made me stronger and this is how i am now able to be fulfilled myself so that i can be of service to others around me So those two working in tandem give us a really, like, clear outlet to the younger generation 
that is open and bright and going to make their choices about how they're going to show up in the world as they come out of university. And then the people who have, you know, maybe already been through a decade or two of that and being able to share their story as well. So it's, it's nice having like a full spectrum of the stories we can tell. Yeah, it's, it's amazing work and watching you do it and watching you like empower other people to do it. I just like kind of was thinking about what it must be like to see someone that comes through, uh, you know, through university or whatever and just volunteers and is an ambassador or whatever and then becomes an employee and then a friend of yours and then you have these amazing life experiences traveling all over the world serving mate and just watching that you know sort of unfurl has to be really gratifying just you know it's, it is wild it is like high level dharmic crazy bardo shit and it's i mean it's yeah it's beautiful it's it's hard to believe that it could be so good you know we're very aware that we most people in the company are in a really sweet spot that we are really privileged to work for such a rad company to like myself i grew up in aspen colorado to amazing parents who were artists my mom was the first female ski patroller and a, a, a world cup racer it's like i didn't have a lot of baggage coming up but i think that's why i have just sought out challenges my whole life that's why i've sought out production that's why i reached out to the company when after I had done my own production company and brought artists into this place that was kind of lacking Aspen is an amazing place and the Aspen idea of having like you know a uh, full mind body and spirit so that you can have new ideas that benefit the world is something I really believe in but it was lacking in like a young artistic culture and I got to really work on that production isn't always the best way to make right. money so maybe that's some adversity is like getting myself into debt but I reached out to Guayaki and just said like hey I know you guys I love you guys you've supported me as an athlete um, if you hire me this is what I would do this is how I do it here's the athletes artists people I know the events I know and I just got an email back that said great we met you at Burning Man we like you we know you we trust you you should just go do it and I was like really did you read my email they were like yeah I mean we were on a surf trip. We didn't read the whole thing, uh, but we trust you, so just go do it. And that's been the way I've been managed the entire time is just trust and empowerment. And that's how I've learned to like manage others, and I've been able to bring on uh, almost 12 of my friends into this team, people I've known my whole life or new friends. And, yeah, it's less about like <coughs> delegation and management. It's about just getting out of the way for honestly where the mate wants to go you know i i can take we all can take some credit for like what we have done to promote this product to promote what we do in the rainforest um what we do with indigenous peoples that we've been working with the whole time and a lot of times i notice that it is the mate moving through me there is honestly a very strong plant spirit i mean this is Mate has 196 active compounds. It's one of the most like fortified, amazing sources of energy and caffeine in the world. And sometimes I'm like running across a festival high speed with just like, you know, some mate in my hand to get it to this person because I just know I need to. And I'm like, I'm not totally in control here. Like this right. is, I feel like the, the last outer leaf and branch of the mate tree sometimes. You know, with our roots being in Argentina and Paraguay and Brazil, where the mate has grown in the rainforest and the shade, we've protected almost 200,000 acres by this point. Like, we have satellite imagery of the areas we work in literally getting greener year by year. And it's cool to feel like I'm at the very end tip of that. Well, that's profound, man. And I, one of the things, the bullet points I was going to run by you was like, I wanted you to break down. Uh, mate for those at home and you did a great job of that just in terms of geographically and and what it's about and how it moves through you and i find you know i'm a heavy coffee drinker but i do enjoy mate especially in a festival environment or you know out among friends uh as sort of like a social drink and uh yeah. you know we had uh we talked earlier um you dropped on me that you know i knew you were from aspen uh, but that your dad was the founder of the Telluride Bluegrass Festival. Yeah, he wasn't actually the founder, but he was one of the guys there at the very beginning. Okay. Um, and he was the MC for over, I think it was 36 years, uh, known as Pastor Mustard. 
Um, I was actually a little Dijon mustard, always on stage. My sister's Poupon. My mom is Honey Mustard when we're in Telluride. And so, yeah, it's an amazing festival. I mean, it was one of the first festivals to think about how to be more green. They were uh, the first B Corporation festival and really a, like, flagship leader in, like, how to do it right. And Telluride is just such an amazing corner of Colorado and the artists who's come through there and you know the people I grew up with you know my dad's best friends are Sam Bush, Bela Fleck, Edgar Meyer, Jerry Douglas you know like kind of the greats of yeah. new American Americana picking yeah. and yeah it's, it's like set a pretty right there. dude it's a pretty high yeah. bar to sure. set probably part of why I like I think my dad is sometimes disappointed that I didn't follow him in music um, but I think it growing up in Aspen I was like I just want to play outside all the time I can't you know I play banjo a little bit and I've found other weird outlets of music Tuvan throat singing after I went to Mongolia and just weird rapping and stuff like that but I found much more of my expression like through movement in in many different mediums but um, it's been cool to see that the music is part of my DNA and it's been more about how I can support artists and bring them and like put them on a stage not just to play a show but you know hopefully in formats where it's like really inspiring people towards a common goal or a cause or a solution yeah definitely and so uh, interestingly enough because you mentioned about being outdoors and stuff and you know I don't know you really outside of the music festival or uh mate world if you will but just judging from some social media or stories you've told or things i've heard about you you're all over the world really doing adrenaline junkie like incredible intense slightly dangerous stuff um which it runs in a definitive juxtaposition to like the cool calm collected chill cat that i'm around everywhere but the dance floor you know so how did uh colorado obviously is is a harbinger of those type type of activities but uh, maybe just tell the people a little bit about how you found your way into like chasing whatever that energy is that makes you like jump off a mountain or like the crazy ski stuff that you do and that whatever the gliding is like yeah. just go there yeah well you know a lot of people see that stuff as being an ad- adrenaline junkie adrenaline is what happens when things go wrong what I really feel like I'm chasing is flow you know and it's it's flow sports it's flow movements it's and obviously, so some of my first access points to that, I, I started skiing when I was literally like one and a half years old. Um, it was, you know, my focus through most of my young life. I did moguls, I did park and pipe. Um, I was on the free ski world tour for a while. And um, yeah, I mean, I, there's so much, you know, that so many ways that we like all compare each other to each other like in the world of cities and social structures but in nature you know you can never truly overcome it but like you can push your own boundaries any day any time especially when you live in a place like aspen which is uh, unique in its geology ecology and proximity really to like so many forms of sport and then that evolved to, you know, climbing. I've climbed El Cap a couple times, done it in a day. I um, got into paragliding and uh, skydiving in college, and then that turned into speed flying. Speed flying is like a smaller paraglider, a quarter the size and about four times as fast, one that we can, I can use it in the winter with my skis on, and it's fast enough that I can take off, take back down, touch back down again, and it's pretty much the fucking coolest thing in the world. I mean, I've taken off from the top of the Eiger before and flown 6,000 feet to the valley floor. And at times, like if I'm doing a barrel roll, I come out at 80 miles per hour. And it's, you know, the, the flow experience, which flow probably has a lot of meanings for a lot of people. For me, I'm, I've also done the like uh, flow genome projects, uh, leadership and training certification program, the book Rise of Superman and Sealing Fire with uh, Jamie Wheel and Stephen Kotler has been really influential for me because it gives me like a lexicon and a vocabulary to talk about that sensation I've been chasing my whole life and it's amazing I, I put as much time as I can to like being outdoors because it is so rejuvenating chasing that thing is like you know leads to a lot of growth and yeah being calm and collected is the only way to do it it seems sometimes like daredevil stuff but 
you know, some of the bigger flights of my life are things I've been preparing for for eight, nine years. And, you know, even that, honestly, is part of what's led me to doing production, doing what I do with this company, because that feeling you get when you can turn off the noise a little bit when time dilates, when it slows down and you just know what to do even though you've never done it before. I found that when you are working with other people, when you're doing production, when there's so many variables coming in and it's so challenging, that that feeling that only lasts for sometimes a couple seconds or a few minutes when you're, whatever, surfing, skiing, flying, that stretches out sometimes to days or even weeks when you are in a heavy production flow. So, I mean, I think that's why I'm still so engaged in finding the way to, like, do whatever you want to call it, the conscious parties, the, the formative events, the things that can, like, inspire people beyond just the group around me. And it's because also you get to experience group coherence, group flow. And it's a, it's a special feeling to chase. Indeed, man. And, and I just want to clarify, when I said uh, Adrenaline Junkie, it wasn't in any way like derisive or no, I, I don't think see that's it. how most people would you know, explain but, it <laughs> but you don't come at it like you aren't beating your chest look at me it's really inspiring to see that you take the time that you have away from you know your other uh, you know endeavors and and that flow state is is what drives you to chase it all over the world and, and it's not like you're doing it by yourself you're doing it with your buddy Carl you're doing it with your friends your, your partners and so forth and it's inspiring to see it's what I wanted to ask about it not so much to hear you tell tales of defying death as much as like where does that come from and then when you broke it down for me it's like I grew up in Jersey near Philly spent my summers at the Jersey Shore the only thing I really had access to on a regular basis like that was surfing and it took it's my favorite thing in the world I don't do it nearly enough but those moments in my life where like time stands still and you sort of enter a different consciousness uh, when it's just man stick wave movement like the most primitive shit on earth and if you can harness that whether it's getting in the barrel just riding down the line like to be in that harmony and and that flow state as you put it is is really you can't get there with drugs or with music or you you can maybe you can with i mean i think it's the state that all people are actually seeking all the time and that's why people even like to watch music is because like it's complicated stuff and you're watching a, again a band a group fall into flow together right. and they could mess it that's why we like live music so much is like it could go wrong but right. it when it doesn't and it's perfect it's a beautiful thing and you can feel it even if you're not in the band same you know I don't love what well, I think you know team sports are not something I know something you love right. I actually think it's like totally bad for our society right. that people put so much attention into it but i understand I why they do because i disagree it's like, with you i don't disagree with you yeah i think they do it because they they even just seeing a moment of flow can on an athletic field yeah it, that makes people feel something and makes them feel a part of something and i hope we can find more ways to encourage people to like jump into that themselves yeah what you're describing and when we're talking about surfing, what is an individual? It's like, no, I'm not like r rooting or watching or observing, but I'm like participating. I'm like yeah. becoming it. And I think that's important. That was something that I always thank my folks for is like uh, enabling me to and facilitating surfing yeah. at such a young age. And like, that was the closest my suburban strip mall self really got to like being one with nature. So that's why I look at a lot of what you do with such awe. And it's not like, uh, it's not something that I, I could have ever really seen myself doing, but when I see somebody that I know and admire, respect, my friend, um, it's it's really just epic, you know. So I please, feel, yeah. Thank I mean, you I for feel sharing it with the world, you know. It's, totally, it's, it's inspiring. I know it's hard. I don't actually like post or do that much, but I do have enough people who are like, dude, please, like I am loving your yeah. adventures, and I'm like, okay. I mean, if that is inspiring for you, it great. Is. And I just feel very grateful that, you know, I feel like I've won the lottery several times over to be, like, born in a place as beautiful as Aspen, to have cool parents, to, like, have a healthy body. And I love being able to use it in that way to, again, just, like, see where my boundaries are and see if I can push just a little bit beyond them. Right on. Yeah, and, and you had said earlier we were talking about musicians falling into the flow state and, like, you know, other than what I'm talking about, whether it be with surfing or 
the different endeavors that you know take you all over the world in search of that um music is what brings us together music the culture whether it's festival culture or just being in a room with a band or a dj and like i've seen you on many dance floors as a matter of fact the first time i ever encountered you may not remember was at envision my first time was like 2014 at a sunrise and you know i had like these homer simpson slippers on and <laughs> you kind of came up to me it was frenetic dancing and uh, you just sort of stopped in your tracks and just like this fucking guy and then we just had this moment and then you know, I met you and we encountered each other and it was a few months later uh, from New Orleans to St. Augustine in Florida. Yeah, that's and right. And I saw you a bunch around Jazz Fest and uh, that was a great Jazz Fest when uh, Rising Appalachia played with yeah. Fevery Corporation and then yeah. they did their own gig. And, yeah, um, you know, that's I actually remember that show. So I was... for feels like just extra on the, on the cake of life, but I was very fortunate to see rising appalachia just be blown away and reached out to them and just said like i need to bring you to aspen they kind of were like who is this kid like why are we doing this i was like i don't have a venue i don't have any money to pay you but you need to come and they did they go where they're invited um you know when they can and it's grown into an amazing actually just it's grown into an amazing relationship uh after i hustled you know dinner and hot tubs and ski tickets and all these things they were like i something's different here and um, a couple days later they asked if I wanted to be their tour manager they had never had one before that's what you were when I met you you were in the capacity of their tour manager yeah so I spent like you know a better part of a year traveling around with this band that I absolutely admired and um, they were incredible mentors for me like each member of Rising Appalachia Leah, Chloe, David and Biko each have such a like strong I call them you know Leah's the spark Chloe's the sweet one David's the sensitive and Biko's the strong one and each of them had so much to teach me and I remember at that show actually as we were watching Thievery Corporation unload from their two tour buses and we were just in our little black van we were just like they were like I don't know if we want to grow to that point and Biko said like we do but we only want to grow when our community grows with us and that always really stuck with me as well as, well as so many you know amazing lessons about how to use music as a voice for activism, how to like rejuvenate the people who are on the front lines for social and environmental justice. And um, yeah, I mean, really they have been huge in like kickstarting a lot of my thinking and a lot of my career and being able to like blend the desire to play my part in, in saving the world or making it a better place for future generations and how to use music as a catalyst for that and it's amazing that we still get to work together because um, through many accounts of serendipity and life just putting us together like we were there at the beginning of Come to Life we work closely with Guayaquil you know they helped me get the job and I helped them come closer into the company and all those things and mutually I, beneficial yeah, it's amazing. And even right now, I just got a text from Leah and David uh, five minutes ago. They're with my parents right now. They're staying at my house for like a week and a half. When I go home, uh, we're going to do a backpacking trip. And it's just been one of the most, yeah, rewarding relationships of my life. And amazing that we get to work together. Yeah, I was like kind of, you'd say you read my mind. You've like already hit off a bunch of the bullet points that I was going to hit on about, you know, earlier and now we're talking about rising appalachia and how each of the members has these like sort of distinct energy and personas and the alchemy of them coming together and like never mind like the you know the specialty of the music that they put together what it is where it comes from the tradition the heritage the respect it has for what's come before it and elders and indigenous music i mean it's there's just so many layers to what they do and then when you all that you've described about what's important to you and your work and your life and your ideals and, and the symmetry there um, and the fact that they were at a point in their career where they could take a call from a random dude in Aspen you know they, and that you were in a point in your life where you could dedicate that kind of energy and attention to this what if you know you didn't know you were going to become a tour manager or anything like that you just wanted to bring this band to Aspen and out of that relationship has come so much you know to fruition if you will yeah. and I think back to now that I know how green you were at that moment when I met you and you were on the road with them, the fact that you, you know, I asked you and I hardly knew you, but I had a good friend who was from the area who had experienced Rising Appalachia at Jazz Fest and wrote something he wanted to share with his hometown and said, hey, could my buddy rock this 
spoken word poem slam before they go on. You kind of like, again, like like at Envision, you like gave me this once over and just like thought about it, and uh, and you were kind enough and benevolent to let him do it, and it was an amazing moment for him. And I mean, when the curtain went up and they were doing their like band huddle and they pulled him in, you yeah. know, it was just like such a beautiful, raw, awesome moment of like worlds colliding and it really served to I mean I just had a lot of affinity for you and I love Scott he's like my little brother and uh, and uh, their new album's great they added this new member with Duncan right fiddle player yeah as well as Aruna who's like right. an Angoni player he's and been playing with them for years and it, what's special I love how they always introduce them they're like yeah people are always excited when we say we're like third generation folk artists Aruna is literally a 150th generation musician from Burkina Faso it's so they they truly are like world folk is yeah. the genre that they're playing and um, yeah it's such a cool thing definitely my favorite band in the world and cool to say that they're all close fa- friends and mentors and it, it goes both ways I've been able to kind of be there you know after I stopped being their tour manager they were like you are our lifetime adventure manager and so it's been cool to like take them paragliding take them on uh, you know whatever climbing adventures and pretty funny how it all works out it's you know when you look backwards it's like the serendipity of life happens so much now that it's like I'm never there are no surprises but I'm always surprised right yeah and and it was a joy to uh, you know because I've kept in touch with you through you know the festival world and such but uh, you know Jazz Fest is my first love and before I was ever going to Burning Man or the West Coast Festival scene or any of that, I've been going to Jazz Fest for a long time. And deep into that narrative, you came into my sort of Jazz Fest world a few years back when you were talking about the thievery year. Yeah, and, uh, and I've been every year since. And exactly. Yeah. So I was going to say, you've, <laughs> you've just written yourself into that part of my life uh, or our community, if you will. And this year was really sweet because the Music Box event, and you were kind enough to tip me off to sort of like a private album release thing. And then they did their traditional show at uh, One Eyed Jacks. So you know, when possible, obviously you make you incorporate what you're doing, and you still are in service to them. So the relationship is remains as like fervent as ever. Just like their career, uh, you said they added Aruna Duncan. So they're performing as a six piece now, yeah. and uh, sonically, um, it's really opened up a lot of new avenues for where their music can go. And you can hear that on the Ley Lines record. Yeah. Yeah, man, it's cool. I mean, same as they do. It's like they they know and I know that the more... It's same as like when I'm skiing. Like, I, skiing alone is cool, but for every friend that I'm like cruising down the hill with and I know how they ski and how they turn, you know, my experience is amplified. And I think that's the same with music. And that's why people like the big jams and like to see collaborations. And um, they really do leave a lot of space to like support the the people around them and I try to do the same exactly there's a parallel there as well we want to get a touch on a little bit about uh, Burning Man Um, a variety of reasons I would want to talk to you about it some of my favorite playa memories and you're present and uh, ran into you this year at the foam home the uh, FOMO Genesis I believe is what the name of the camp was this year and I know that you know with Goyaki and even predating uh, Goyaki you know, you've had a relationship with the Bronner's camp and such. Um, Burning Man's such a divisive topic in the community, and you really articulate. <laughs> <It's so silly. laughs> it is, but it is totally. I mean, it, it is silly, but it, it it remains a fact that for as much as like we want to celebrate and enjoy it, and I and I love it, and I know you do too. And that's why we go back. Um, we have to defend it all the time. Yeah. So I just, if you wouldn't mind, you don't have to answer this. We can edit it out. No, um, I'd love to. You know, you're a guy who spent the last 40 minutes talking about the importance of like health and the earth and like good news network, awakening people, empowering them to, you know, come to life, if you will. Um, And then the sort of mass populist perspective of Burning Man is either forget the hedonism, it's just the consumption and carbon footprint and stuff uh, associated with, you know, the antithesis of sustainability. What do you say to that? Well, yeah, I mean, it's even beyond sustainability. Like, the reason I keep saying regenerative is, like, regenerative to me is also being 
real. It's about being a stoic and actually looking at the chessboard ahead of you and not pretending that some things aren't there. Like my company, Burning Man, everything we do is creating waste. If we pretend it's not, then we're not going to find the right solutions. And I've been going, this is my 11th Burning Man in a row. Um, you know, and it's been a place where I can go. I've had many personal transformations. Like I said, that's where I met like the Guayaki founders and how I got this job. And even the the way I met like the Abraxas crew is I actually organized a ninja attack against them because they come out as the Tsunamurai and it failed horribly and they made me do push-ups and it kind of made me their ninja bitch. Um, but Tim, Tim's big on push-ups. Yeah. <laughs> and they, but through that we forged a lifelong friendship as you do with many challenges if you decide to take them on. And yeah, I mean, I'm also a rational optimist. It's like if you look at the meta numbers of a lot of things in the world, like we're doing really great in a lot of ways. I don't think we are with climate, but like humans are living longer, living better lives, more people living a higher standard of living, less children dying at childbirth, like less people for disease, famine, warfare than any other time on earth. And Burning Man is a good example of like, yeah, we could focus on how much gas goes there, but also we we celebrate and laud the people who are taking a vacation somewhere and I, I'm sure it wouldn't be that hard to calculate like how many gallons of jet fuel equal what goes into Burning Man and it's probably what happens in a single day for one airline you know and so it's like we do need to rest sometimes we do need to generate or rejuvenate we do need to like find inspiration to keep going to like get back into the game and Burning Man is like one of the best examples in the world of how to do that and it can be looked at as a hedonistic party but anyone who actually goes knows that it's about the magic it's about the art it's about like the inspiration about the connections you can have with people and they're doing real work too you know whether it's burners without borders whether it's like burning man's actual civic engagement with cities all over the country all over the world with regional burns there's more good being done through burning man than like most organ like real work not just like this is what we aspire to one day or wouldn't this be great but like no, no no we're going to mayors we're going to governments we are going to like city planners and showing them how like the power of just putting more art in their city can make real change in people's like happiness health and and beyond personal transformation turned into because i love the transformational culture of the west coast i love that you know it's largely about personal transformation and i feel very strongly that where that needs to be taken is like if if you are able to be full yourself then you're ready to be in service to others and they're a great example of that this event is an awesome example of that and that's i feel like the next step after you heal your own trauma which can be very ongoing but after you like become aware that that journey is your own to take on then you can help others do the same indeed and that's what they mean when they say you take take that playa magic home and apply it the other 51 weeks out of the year to not just your life but your community and those around you that's definitely what i've gotten out of the burn and it's encountering folks like yourself and uh you know, myriad others who have, and in one way or another, illuminated how I might be in greater service. So I hope that um, this discussion, maybe uh, not unlike the one I had with Ryan Rising, who was here, um, awesome. people really dug the episode we did because it enlightened them to stuff they didn't otherwise know. Yeah. And I think that that this is uh, similar to that in the sense that you know we talked about a lot of other stuff besides music and. Uh, that's important, I think, for not just the show, but for this culture. Because you talk about the West Coast festival world, and like, I see that's primarily where I see you. Because, you know, mm -hmm. I'm in the media thing, and you're usually there in some capacity with Guyaki, if not with Rising Appalachia. And I think that that's a work in progress, like the, the action side of it. Right. Like, we got the dance floors. I see you at Dim and Saints at 2 in the morning, and we know how to do that proper. Yeah. But the action. Uh, you know, there's a lot of brilliant minds and people activating, but but yeah. the work is a work in progress, and and that's why I wanted to do this interview with you. So and I'm glad you brought up Ryan because like we're working with Permaculture Action Network now as like a partner on every one of these campaigns we're doing, 
And the reason like him and I connect so well and as organizations we do is it's it's about really doing the work, you know? They have been doing it for years. It, there's not you don't always meet people who are like, "Yeah, I've been doing this for the 5 years or the last 5 years, you know, Silicon Valley for as many ideas as they have. People bounce around a lot." You know, they've got this huge idea it's going to change the world and they're doing something different in three months. And so I really like and respect the people who are boots on the ground, actually moving it out of the West Coast. You know, it's been amazing for us to do campaigns in Austin, in New York. We did them in New Orleans. Yeah, we did a month in uh, Uruguay and uh, Argentina this year. And we're as a company, we're starting to go more global and... Yeah, it's cool to take the like lessons and ethos that we've learned on the West Coast and and just do it and go out there and actually learn the lessons. And it's not that I'm not into the like moonshots and the big ideas that you find here in the Bay, but I want to see them put into action because like you're gonna like, you're gonna learn stuff along the way. And if you bail when it gets hard. Um, then you're not in the right spot or it's not the right idea and so it's rad when things are like hey this is kind of simple it's not necessarily easy but it's definitely needed so like we're gonna do it and we're gonna keep doing it and we're gonna make it a better and better model so that other people can follow it and it can actually like make some real impact most specifically, what, I'm curious, because I saw some photos of you and Ryan, and what was the thing in Brooklyn? What what did you guys come together to do and spend... You were, like, out there for a month or something. Yeah, so it's cool to just, like, go to these cities and find something that is locally germane and, and pertinent to that area. Um, you know, in Denver and Boulder, we did... Uh, that was the first kind of, like, campaign. Um, and we do shows, we do dinners and dialogues, and we're mostly, like, finding the cause or the solution that we can get behind that's not too political that is you know positive that is a solution and not come in as like saviors like well why is just gonna fix this problem but instead uplift and promote the organizations that are already working on it make sure they know each other so that they're working together and we did anti-recidivism we ended up doing actually two concerts with rising appalachian the largest male penitentiary in the state it was one of the most surreal days of my life um, in Austin, we did healthcare for musicians and worked with Ham, who provides healthcare for you know the musicians of the music capital of the world. Who a lot of them wouldn't be there if they didn't have that service. And in New York, it was New Urban Food Systems, which um, you know it's one of the biggest food markets in the world. And there's amazing stuff going on with urban gardens, vertical farms, like food distribution services, and even some of the, like, although so much food goes in there, the South Bronx is one of the worst, like, food deserts in the country. So where there's problems, there's opportunity. And so we worked with Permaculture Action Network on Action Days and some of those, like, dinner and dialogues that we're starting to do now. And then in L.A. in October, which is where we're headed next, is uh, green spaces and tree planting. You know, uh, they made a million tree kind of proclamation from the mayor's office a few years ago, and it's still being worked on. And it's kind of expanded to, like, tree TLC as well, because it's not just the sexy part of planting new trees, but actually taking care of the one there to, like, reduce the, the whatever they call it, the heat spot that a lot of cities create. So, yeah, it's pretty exciting. We're working with, like tree people tree folks kiss the ground which does like soil um workshops and and courses on like the importance of soil health which is actually the most important thing for us to be doing along with tree planting for trapping carbon is actually done through like the mycorrhizal fungi that's in the soil that sucks the carbon that the trees are catching and then they trade it for the minerals through the mycorrhizal fungi so you know, working with organizations like wow. that, really putting them on the spotlight, which is what we can do with our resources, feels like the best way for us to really show up as a brand and as um, the way we want to be seen as standing for, I don't know, what's what's right and activism and just like inviting people to like just jump on, in and do the work now. Really, really amazing and inspiring. Man. And I, I'm from the East Coast. I spent a lot of time in New York. And uh, I just was always curious about how you were taking what we're talking about here, this sort of activation and mindset, um, and really boots on the ground in a place like New York. And um, there's a lot more I want to talk to you about, but we probably got to wrap it up. So uh, we'll do a part two 
in like a year or two okay. and catch up on a lot of this stuff. I wanted to say, um, obviously, thank you. And it was a great walk down memory lane. And now I got lots of material to bring up off the air where I need further explanations. But I want to say thanks for everything you've done for me, like dialing me in, whether it be Rising App or in the festival world, or always having a smile and a mate for me whenever I belly up to the uh, mata, matarea? Mateada. Mateada. And uh, lastly, uh, much like I asked Ryan at the end, I was like, I know people are going to want to know more um, or even connect with you. So what's the best way to either, you know, if someone hears this, they encounter you at a festival, they listen to this podcast, whatever it is, and they're like, I want to be in on this, uh, come to life. Herbal Mate, whatever it is, how do they find you? What's the best uh, method of connection? Yeah, I mean, check out all of the amazing like media and content we're making on cometolife.com and come to life on Instagram, um, guayaki.com for if you want to come to some of these like campaigns and events that we're producing ourselves, um, guayaki.com slash events. Um, I'm Rube underscore on the road. That Instagram, you can hit me up there. Kerouac? Inspired? Um, I actually don't even like Kerouac because when I read his books, I was like, dude, my life is so much more interesting than this guy. <laughs> and like, I'm so bored. But yeah, no, I picked that for, I, I, rather than like, for me, it's not about Kerouac. It's about like reading Dune and Stranger in a Strange Land. It's the sci-fi that's like inspiring, strangely enough. But um, another yeah. layer. I mean, let's just meet in person. You can find us at places like Lightning in a Bottle, Symbiosis when it happens, when we're doing these spots city by city will probably be in San Francisco and Chicago next year and um, you know when people sometimes ask it's a very different paradigm for us of like how we can support people than you know let's say other energy drinks like Rockstar and Red Bull how they have it's like slapping a sticker on someone sponsoring them and but you know I have a lot of respect for like what Red Bull has brought into the culture of the sports that I hold dear to my heart but it's cool that what we get to stand for rather than like going big and doing backflips is you know activism social environmental stewardship and connection and community and when people ever ask like dude i love mate i drink it all the time like can you sponsor me i always kind of turn it around on i'm like well you know happy to give you some mate especially if you're sharing it with your community but what i would ask you is like what are you doing to engender community what are you doing to like support the world around you especially if it comes to regeneration sustainability social environmental action and stewardship that's a good note to go out on man that was really well stated and articulate and empowering man it makes me want to go out there and do some important work yeah let's so, do it together man yeah, we already I are i love seeing you be i always like especially in new orleans and around i see you and i'm like i'm in the right spot it's funny uh, thank you and it's humbling to hear that but when you said that to me at burning man you know we were standing there naked in the in the foam dome and you're like now i know i'm in the right spot because you're here and i was like man I couldn't have said it to you fast enough because I feel like when I'm around and there's Ruben, it means that I'm in the place to be too. So we're both in this spot and it's a joy and a, a pleasure to call you a friend and thank you for the interview. Yeah, thank you, man. I'm really like honored to be able to just sit down with you and I love you and this is, uh, I love podcasts so I'm really excited. This is the first time I've done one and I hope it's well received and would love to do more in the future. Yeah, you know, people are going to ring you. They're going to want to know more. So with that, I'm going to sign off here from Planet Home on a Saturday night in San Francisco. I'm with Ruben Sadowski of Come to Life in Goyaki, Urba Mate. This is B Gets the Up for Life podcast, and we will see you next time. Booyah! Indeedy. I want to say thank you to Ruben Sadowski from Goyaki Urban Mate and you know, close friend and former tour manager of Rising Appalachia for that just tremendous interview at Planet Home. 
It took place in early September in San Francisco. In the interview, you heard uh, us, or really me, tell the story of uh, when I asked Ruben if uh, my friend Scott T could uh, recite a poem before they took the stage, Rising Appalachia took the stage in uh, St. Augustine. It was a few days after Jazz Fest 2014. I had recently met Ruben initially, uh, like I said, at Envision. <clears throat> but uh, got to know him a little bit at Jazz Fest that year. And then just asked him, hey, can my boy do this poem? He's an incredible wordsmith and orator and slam poet, if you will. And a dear friend, and he wrote this in the aftermath of, of experiencing Rising Appalachia and going to Jazz Fest and in the spirit of adventure and, as I now know, the flow state. Um, Ruben allowed it, and Scott delivered an impassioned uh, poem to the good folks of St. Augustine, Florida, in May of 2014. So through the wonders of the internet and the magic of YouTube, I have that poem to play for you right now. So we're going to reel off the Scott T opening for Rising App uh, slam poem is the best way I could put it. It's a five minute piece as well worth your time. And then at the end of that poem, we'll be back with Bo Williams, tour manager and production manager with Lettuce. One more thing, if y'all are listening, uh, if you want this Rising Appalachia show in full from Jazz Fest, One-Eyed Jacks, this past May, basically the opening show from the Ley Lines tour, their fantastic new album, um, email the show, b.gets at upfullife.com, and I will hook you up with this Rising Appalachia show. Now, Scott T. Has anybody seen my queen from New Orleans? I thought I saw her last night in a dream, standing on second and dryad. She had feathers in her dreads and said she come from a place called Trinidad. And last night, I wish you would have seen us the way we was dancing uptown at Tipitina's. The way she moved her hips, she was my voodoo queen. And when I kissed her lips, she called me her Zulu king. Now she's gone. Exists only in song. But you don't need the words to sing along. Sip your spirit and you may hear it. The symphony of soul. Boundless and free as you and me into nothing you should mold. Limitless lands never outlined by man sing lullabies for the stars. And the language with no words would be heard if you listened with the heart. Since from the very start, you know beyond knowing exactly what is true. Then fight your whole life to remember nobody is smarter than you. Class is in session. Life is the lesson. Now is the time to pay attention. Us versus them, again and again. TV telling me of my enemies, but I'm busy making friends. Think yeah. hot when I forget I forgot. Usually it's motivated by fear. Felt the reception of the resurrection, found joy in the taste of tears. And suddenly, this whole thing feels like a dream I can remember clear. Us locals live in love, caught a glimpse from above, and now everywhere is here. When I'm done being busy being who I think I am, I'll finally be with it and you'll see a new man standing boldly. Or rather, I'll transcend gender and all you'll see is the plan unfolding. A manifesto, manifestation, a mass realization that Earth is one nation, but not under God, for we are within God. I oppose those 
ones who govern thinking they stand at higher elevations. Truly, we as their worker be always a balance in the equation. But you don't see me occupying the streets make the life I lead my demonstration. If I say it shall be so, then so it shall be. We will shine internally, eternally with elation. Harmonies of pleasure and harm in me make me arrive while departing my destination. When I can't tell the calm in me from the bomb in me is when I tune into the higher vibration. The clock strikes. Now is the hour. Don't touch the lights. People have the power. Ruminate, illuminate your mind. Don't hate while you get a taste of time. Could you relate to the river as it starts to wind, or do you shake and quiver up and down your spine? Love from above is down below. Open your heart and up it flows. Feel the tingles as your skull mingles with what's within is without no doubt. Like a drought missing rain, a junkie missing a fix, a masochist missing pain, mistaking the prize for the name of the game. Need a new frame of mind outside of loss and gain, fame and shame, pleasure and pain. Opened up my eyes and saw they're all the same. I've just begun to be the one just for fun. Bursting like bubbles, my troubles used to weigh a ton. Are you hearing the sounds or are you hearing your ears? Are you here and now or are you living in fear? Are you seeing the sights or are you watching your eyes? Busy trying to be right, man, drop the disguise. But don't despise its demise, just realize where the eye resides Down deep inside, in between the tides of the moment you're born and the moment you die I hope you hear it when the angels sing hallelujah Don't fear it when the sky rains hallelujah Like a healing of your pain hallelujah Dance hallelujah, be hallelujah so wing hallelujah like an undeniable groove when the spirit shoots through ya. That was my man Scott T dropping it like it was hot back in May 2014. Now we're giving you a second interview here with my man Bo Williams. Bo is the current uh, tour manager and production manager for Lettuce. You know, this is a big Lettuce house here at the Up For Life podcast. And uh, I've had this interview in the chamber since Swanee Rising. So that was back in April. And uh, it was kind of herky-jerky because we were backstage. Lettuce was going to go on in a couple of hours. Bo was getting set up at this behind the amphitheater stage. You know, mid-festival, final night. Lettuce finishing the whole thing on the their throne on the amphitheater stage. So Bo's a busy guy, but we'd been trying to angle for this interview for a hot minute. So uh, I had to kind of edit it, cut it up a little bit because there were some peeps in and out. You can hear the band raging in the background um and it's uh, ironic because as you'll hear Bo has you know got a start at swanee and a lot of the folks that have worked for lettuce and have moved on to other situations etc have uh, really you know humble roots at swanee spirit of swanee music park in live oak florida so it was cool to interview Bo there very apropos we shouted out a bunch of folks in the fam and uh, talked about his uh, his journey from you know volunteering at the very first Bear Creek to you know the meteoric ascent of his uh, run with Papadocio, and then uh, the move to Lettuce and and how his responsibilities and job and his whole thing just flipped on its axis. But here he is, uh, killing the game, Bo Williams. Um, and he drops a little bit of knowledge about what's going to happen with uh, some Lettuce shows that have been recorded. And this was before the album came out, so there's a little teasing about the album that's 
Elevate that has since come out. At the time it was untitled, but we knew it was going to drop on June 15. So we talked some of uh, the Elevate recording process as well as uh, how they captured the symphony gig that Lettuce did with the Colorado Symphony back in November 2018. So uh, Lettuce Heads and the Let Army will be pumped to hear all of this stuff. And if you're just a fan of the music business, industry, production, or just a really awesome American dream type tale of just finding your path and going for it and deliverance. Uh, Bo Williams is a great example of that. He's a really swell dude. I'm proud and honored to call him my friend and uh, really stoked to uh, put this interview out that we did some time ago. So here's a, I cut and pasted all the little portions together. It's like 20 minutes with Bo and then we'll be back with the Vibe Junkie Jam of the Week, but not before the climax of this jam from Rage Fest in New Orleans uh, led us back in May. And we're live here backstage in the production area, Spirit of Swanee Music Park, for the inaugural Swanee Rising Festival. This is the Upful Life Podcast. I'm your host, B. Getz, and I have uh, tracked down the elusive Bo Williams, um, who is a man of many hats, but currently a tour manager and basically do everything uh, behind the scenes with our our favorite band lettuce so thanks for coming on the show for a few minutes at this busy time (laughs) thanks so much for having me b yeah man i mean i i've i've said to you before i wanted to do like behind the scenes stuff and not just get the artists and whatnot and it's perfect that we're here because i met you here long before you were involved with lettuce yeah and uh, you have a storied and personal history with the spirit of swanee music park so perfect spot for us to catch up and just kind of get your story and give people like a peek behind the window of, cool. you know how it all happens for you yeah so that. let's start here at the park man what was your uh, virgin voyage here what was the first time you visited here even as a fan or whatever the first time i came here was the first bear creek and i came here with like 30 something volunteers that were like the stage hands if you will the guys doing all the labor and whatnot for the stages and um we camped out we hung out i, I, I ended up coming back the next year or being asked to come back with um, a couple others it was like it was like a group of six of us and we were like the first employed stage hands of the festivals or of, of Bear Creek if you will so we kind of like worked our way up from there um, worked many events at Swanee and uh, over the years went from you know pushing cases to um, running stages to um, running the events to um, and, uh, and yeah, basically just kind of like come through the ropes. But yeah, a lot of it's Swanee, for sure. Right on. Yeah. I mean, you know, one of the folks when I think of, you know, people that I know from coming to festivals here, it's, uh, you know, you're part of that fabric or whatever. So, you know, you were here for the first Bear Creek and, and yeah. a lot has changed since then. Uh, maybe talk about a little bit about what you see now that they come back all these years later. How has the park like sort of uh, streamlined or advanced what they do here as opposed to say when Bear Creek one was in 2008 oh dude so much <laughs> so much especially this stage right right now the amphitheater stage I mean we've seen it go from just the wooden rafters to now it's got like steel reinforcement there was no there was no real way to like a lot of things we do on stages like rolling risers allows us to like pre-stage the band before they go on so we can push them out instead of like have to like try to plug everything in in 20 minutes you know um and there was no like there was, it's not that there was no way there's just not much space so they tried to build out wings and the wings weren't big enough so they tried to like they knocked down these backstage walls that opened up the stage a lot and made it a little more a little more functionable and then um now they've installed like they've got concrete slab in the back they've got a garage door where they can build a stage out and it's uh it's just been great i mean i've 
there was a while back where a tree fell through the stage and really, really, really hurt it. And then that was actually the moment we were able to come in and kind of reinforce it and make it a lot better, you know, before then. I mean, it's always been like the sacred symbol of the park. So everyone's been hesitant to do a lot of, you know, things structurally to it. And now as the, as the park's grown as a whole and had a lot of larger events and just more plentiful events throughout the year, they've uh, been able to put a lot more focus on, you know, the functionality of the stage for sure. And it's, it's been great. <laughs> so. It sounds great, man. It sounds great out there. It looks great, and, you know, and it seems like things kind of like run pretty tight ship wise. I don't know. Maybe there's chaos backstage, but uh, <laughs> it doesn't appear that way from the audience. It seems like it's just a really, really streamlined effort well, here at the matters. park. That's all that matters. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Um, so let's talk a little bit about your pathway uh-huh. you know because you weren't always a tour manager guy you yeah. you worked in production and in sound yeah. so what was your first uh, like entree into that world did you did you go to school for that or did a band scoop you up and say hey figure this out for us <laughs> how did it go um i started a drummer in my younger days um that led into like recording stuff in my basement you know re- like different tracks for me and friends and friends bands and whatnot I fell, I fell in love with recording, and that's what I thought I always wanted to do, was open a studio. That's what my dad did. He, uh, he actually currently works in film, but he, he did a lot with the studio days. Um, and um, my, my, my plan path was just to be a drummer and open a studio. I had no plan for school or anything like that. My mom ended up finding a technical school in Florida. Um, it was an accelerated program, so I could kind of go through it real fast. And, she, you know, she wanted me to get a degree. So I went down there, and I ended up meeting a close group of friends, those same six cats that I told you about earlier that came here to volunteer with, like, the 30-something people. And uh, we shared, like, a common likeness for music as a whole, just live music as a whole, and just kind of, you know, always, like, fed off each other, both professionally and as friends. And um, those same, like, core six I work with all the time still. We're still, like, really close. But um, went to that school... Um, started doing recording there, um, fell into recording live shows, and then I would do like live DVDs. So uh, me and a good friend would like go record the shows. Then we had buddies that you know had a camera crew, and we'd like sync it all later. Bands liked the way the shows sounded on the recordings. So they asked me to start doing their live sound. I kind of kind of how I fell into live sound, and then um, going. You know, I guess Swanee too, like going through the ropes um, of, like I was mentioning, pushing cases to running the stages, to running sound, to running the events, production. Um, I was able to grow, grow that way. And then um, eventually, I was, I was mostly doing event work for a real long time, just strictly events. And then um, eventually I ended up touring, you know. Had a, had a couple bands just say, you know, you're coming. <laughs> and we went out. So, so yeah. That's awesome, man. You know, I was thinking about how you said about, yeah, that crew of six dudes um, that you showed up here and volunteered with Bear Creek in 08. And it was just such, like, um, humble beginnings, such, like, basic, let's throw a festival, really don't know what we're doing here. And then now what we see, what happens here at Halloween and even the smaller events like this one, um, it's not unlike the band that you work with, where it was, like, these six, seven, eight, whatever at the time it was, yeah. dudes that went to Berkeley together and like sure. the brotherhood, and they all decided we're in this together. And here they are, all these years later, still working together. Totally. I mean, have you ever considered that before? No, I never really thought about that. But yeah, totally, totally. Yeah. Uh, how did uh, how did you basically make the decision that you were going to, uh, you know, go on the road and do live sound and like? That this is going to be my gig. Was it something that happened, like where like you knew right away this you were going to be, this is your thing, or did you have to be convinced, or was it the success of one of the bands that you worked with for a say? I had no idea this is where I was going to go. <laughs> I basically showed up at that same festival, got my ass kicked, and liked it. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like just like really worked really hard, met a ton of people there that I hold dearly to this day. Um, that. There's a lot of camaraderie in that. World. Oh, yeah. And especially at this place. Like, I mean, it's all just very family-oriented, and that's kind of like what I've held close to my heart since uh, since day one. 
to really make sure it's everything's family oriented. You know, on the road, we're all like a really close network, band and crew, everyone's equal, we do a lot of fun things together, we all hang out, we're all friends, there's no like separation, and it's just a really good thing. I mean, I met, I met half of our crew at that school. So like we all kind of just, you know, stayed together over the years. So, you know, Andy and me met there, Daniel I met there, um, was doing our lights now. Um, Hunter I met in Atlanta, his brother I was I was close I'm close friends with and went to school with there. So like we all kinda met in Florida and stayed together. And you know, um, went from there. It was great. But yeah, exactly. It's very a lot of camaraderie. A lot of camaraderie. Yeah. Yeah, man. So before you, you guys or you at all were working with Lettuce. You was Papadozio the first band that that took you out, or did you have some other bands before you got with them? I went out for several months with a band called Donna the Buffalo. That was the first tour I ever did. I saw them here. Oh yeah, yeah. That me and uh, me and actually Hunter's brother Cam. We went out there as their sound team for several months, and then um, after them, I was working at a festival, and I was stage managing. And Papadocio, show they had like trailer issues. They ended up showing up pretty late, and we got them on stage real fast. And I'm, I'm pretty strict on like times, <laughs> so I was I was pretty strict on their time. And uh, I ended their show when it was supposed to end. And they were like, "Well, come on, give us one more." And before they knew it, the way they explained it is before they knew it, they were <laughs> their gear was off the stage, house music was playing, the trailer was packed. And they had no idea what to do, and then they approached me about hiring me. <laughs> So that's how that one happened. <laughs> that's awesome, man. And then you had a, a long run with those guys, yeah. right? Yeah, we were together about six years. Me and actually Daniel, who's doing our lights now, we're out forever. Dan, he was looking for- had great success and stuff, and you got to like watch that happen in real time. What was that like? Oh, yeah. I mean, we when we started with them, it was like four lights Daniel owned in a small trailer. And we would like, me and him would be in like his mom's minivan rolling around while the band was in their van rolling around. We'd do like, you know... 11 people in a nine passenger van you know like 11 people in one hotel room <laughs> sneaking up one in the back and, and then you know by the end of it you know we were headlining red rocks and doing full full bus tours so so yeah there was a there was a big 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 watch of growth for that band for sure well deserved yeah that, and that's insane just to for that to be like your first go around too really so like it's not like you toiled in a bus for a decade you know no, before yeah. you guys hit the big time you know yeah, we were all on it together you know <laughs> so at, at a point in time you decided you're going to make a switch and start to work with lettuce and, and it was, not everybody has the good fortune to go from a band of great success like Papadozio lateral move to a band also different kind of success but great success like Lettuce and, and you're at that time still doing sound for Lettuce, right? Mm -hmm. when, when did that happen and what was that transition like? Well, my really good friend Whitney Wangsgaard tour managed the band for a really long time We love Whitney Whitney, very close friend of mine, we worked, we worked together for many years in, in the event world she was always running, yeah. yeah, we started here together did actually I met her at Trinumeral 2008 that was a festival we did together there that's where we first met and then really clicked and then did a ton of events every single year together and kind of like came up in the event world together she always ran the artist relations and like hospitality side of things and I was running the production side of things and it was great um, same network of friends same team back to that like family vibe and um, she I remember when she called me when she got the lettuce gig and I was like that's so cool um, she stayed with them for a while and um, she had asked me to come out a couple different times and I was I was doing different things I was, I was Papa Dose, you know, doing a couple different bands I was doing different different festivals and um, the time came where I needed a change you know what I mean I just like needed a bit of a challenge um, just, uh, just, just a different pace if you will and I was kind of like tossing back and forth what I was going to do and uh, she called me at the same time and was like, hey, I need somebody for lettuce. Um, and I jumped in. So um, I was doing the band's sound and just their production management. And she was handling all the touring, logistics, and stuff like that. Um, and then eventually Whitney jumped into another band and uh, we were trying to find another tour manager. And the one job I promised myself I'd never do <laughs> was tour managing. <laughs> Just because there's like a whole different personal dynamic, you know, like you really got to learn people. Production, you're like, okay, the gear's got to be here at this time, it's got to be set at this time, it doesn't matter what has to happen to make it happen, make it happen. Um, you know, the crew, you can be like, you know, 
it's going to be rough, but it's going to happen. And tour management, there's like, you know, you got to learn everyone's everyone's everything from like, you know, who likes this person to who doesn't like this person to who likes to eat this and doesn't like to eat this to who, you know, likes an aisle seat versus a window seat and who will sit in a van for this time of day and who wakes up at this time. You know what I mean? Just like a, just like every single personal dynamic of every person you have to learn. Um, and that's, <laughs> that was also a moment where I wanted a different challenge. And so I decided what better challenge than to take the gig that I said never do. So I had asked, I was sitting in, I was sitting in a field with Andy and one of our other lighting designers at the time, Blake, and um, we were like, it was one of those just brutal festival days. You know, it was hot as sin. It's just muggy. Rain had come through. You know, nothing was really right at all that we advanced. It was just us sitting in a field, like being like, man, we really need another person. And that's when I thought of it. I was like, well, I can be technical, and I can also, you know try to learn this so what if I became the tour manager and production manager and just handled all the band's logistics and then we hired another sound guy that's when I called Hunter and um, that way we could have you know four production oriented crew on the fly dates and stuff so it worked out really well we had a good time yeah I mean it's going great and seamless transition I mean Whitney was awesome and I loved <laughs> the best part about her you know being tour manager was just like you know it's my favorite band it's a great woman she's done like incredible things oh, yeah. career-wise like starting in this very office so we're having this conversation yeah. basically and totally. and i'm proud and honored oh, you know yeah. to know her and it's amazing that she you know is so intricately woven into your story and the story of swanee it's appropriate we should talk oh, talk yeah. about her and show her some love so thank you for explaining that no it's great i mean everybody's everybody's strong and connected i mean from i met I met one of the band's managers, Hillary, um, with Whitney too. We were doing another event, and Hillary came to help out Wit, and uh, another person that just clicked. We stayed together the whole time, so all all of us on the Lettuce team behind the scenes have been together for you know over a decade. <laughs> you know what I mean? And you have like a you're a tour manager in name, and you do all the tour manager stuff and logistics, but you actually have a much more wide net that you cast in terms of your your influence on the lettuce machine if you will you know what i mean like yeah. you, you find yourself crossing over into just like all these other different roles too if it comes naturally to you sure i mean the best the best part about that whole like family camaraderie we were talking about is that everybody's not afraid to wear multiple hats and everybody's not afraid to give input everyone's on the same page of driving you know the band forward as much as we can there's nobody who just treats it like a day job you know it's it's very far from a day job <laughs> but, uh, but there's not a single person behind the scenes that doesn't have the same forward thinking vision as all the band members are trying to make it all happen um, and it's just it just really helps propel it with all of us having been closely together and working together for so long knowing how each other to work being able to be friends and work together especially in this world is kind of intense you know and it's it's great it's, you know not a better group of people i was just going to say like this has got to be awesome for you when you talk about challenges because you're about to get into like an album cycle and a lot of high profile stuff um there's a lot of great things a lot of excitement we got a lot of plans there's a lot of cool things happening for the band um I mean, I definitely don't see anything staying steady or slowing down. It's just gonna keep going faster and faster. <laughs> yeah, it's a it's it's a cool time right now. There's a lot of cool things in the works. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> well, we're looking forward to it. I mean, oh, I meant to mention the uh, orchestra, you know, and that was recorded and, and documented. So yeah. people people are just clamoring. You know, they yeah. they, they want to hear the new record. They want to hear the orchestra thing. And it's I'm, uh, you know. <laughs> it's all coming. Yeah, the orchestra thing was really special. That was probably one of the most special shows that any of us have ever done but me for sure I mean that was just it was really cool um, yeah that was like uh, that was definitely a fun like logistical thing too you know like um, no one ever brought in like moving lights and to hang them in the truss and run motors up in the air and stuff and we did that there um, brought in our good friend Michael Smalley um, to do lights for that one we were in the middle of transitioning between uh, two lighting designers and Michael jumped in we needed someone to kind of be focused on it for you know a month or so beforehand to kind of help build the package get the rig happen get some programming done really make it make it shine he did a great job um, and then to see the band I mean this band's just such a good group of musicians 
it's just nothing's better than to watch them get on a stage with other extremely strong, well-known rec- you know, musicians and really just feed off each other. And to see them with like a full symphony was just super special, you know. From like having the conductor over for the rehearsals and like just moving everything forward and like everybody intermingling, and then to have the symphony talk about how, you know, they'd never experienced something like the lettuce crowd. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, everyone came dressed to the nines, but, like, you know, I do a security meeting every night, and that was a really funny one, because they were like, well, what are we going to expect? You know, it's going to be this, be that, and I was like, no, nah, man, everyone's really cool, but, like, no one's going to sit in those chairs. And, like, the problem get the bar until it's time to play, so, like, we got to get people to their seats, or we're not going to start on time. And then we get to, like, the back end of, like, where you have to end in this time by city law, or, like, you get fined, and there's all these, like, you know, back and forth things, and I'm just like, you know, well, it's going to be a great show, and then every musician, like, all the lead, you know, chairs and everything were like jumping up after and wanting to take pictures of the band because they've never experienced a crowd like that. To have like full blown, you know, cheering and screaming and like running up and down the aisles, like yeah. <laughs> they never, they never saw anything like that there. So it was, it was really cool. That's awesome, man. Make me a, uh, make me kind of envious, you know, that I, FOMO. You know, I knew it. That's why I'm asking about the recordings because yeah. you know people are just dying so that, that weren't able to make it. We were, we brought in like, um, we brought in a seven camera crew. Seven camera. So yes, yeah, so we brought in we brought in a seven camera HD crew, a bunch of red cameras, what they're called. They're one of the higher end cameras you can you can bring in and have like a small footprint and functionality. And uh, we brought in seven of those. We brought in a boom, our whole jib rig, which is like one of those crane camera systems you see. As so we put that behind the band, um, we had fixed angles, we had fisheye lenses, we had things like rigged up in the trussing, which is way above all the seating and the the, the Betcher concert hall is one of the largest symphonic halls in the U.S. And it's fully what we call in the round. So the stage is in the middle and there's seating completely around it. And that one was super cool. It tiered like five, seven, five to five or six like stories of seating. And they, they did it in like, it wasn't just your typical like arena style you know, seating. It was like, there was like a single row of chairs all the way above like the sound shields and stuff like that. Looking through everything like to, it was, it was just really cool. The venue was awesome. But yeah, we stuck cameras all over that thing, and we fully multi-tracked everything, all high definition. It's all sitting there, and you know we're trying to figure out a really cool way to bring it to the masses for sure. There's a lot of special special talks with that. Well, that's that's why I asked, man, because I just you know wanted to feed the 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 masses, the let army, just a little bit, so they know it's coming. And it, and obviously it was a full scale, you know, top shelf. From the performance to the technology to all the energy you just talked about that you put into capturing it, so you know, patience. We got it. We'll, we'll wait for it. You know, we get the new record coming, <laughs> and you know, it's not a lot of the stuff that was performed is on the new record. So of course, the album, studio album, is going to come first. So, sure. what can you let folks know? Pull up, yeah. So the band came into Denver and we recorded in a studio outside of Denver called Sonic Ranch. Or no, I'm sorry that we were at Colorado Sound there. Sonic Ranch is where they're mixing it in El Paso. Um, so we um, went to the studio for like, I think it was like six total days and they recorded like, <laughs> like, like it's high 20s, low 30s amount of songs. You know what I mean? It's, it's like unheard of. <laughs> unheard of. Just like take, done, take, done. Just like nonstop for the whole time and it was, it was awesome and they brought in um, this awesome dude named Russ Elevato. Um, he's really, you know, really behind the Neil Soul movement. He's really, um, you know, um, D'Angelo, Fela Kuti. You know, what I mean, like just like a lot of people that talk about like the level of respect. You know, what I mean, from our musicians to him, and just um, there's that's another like person that they really feed off well. And he clicked with the band, clicked everybody, and just really did a great job. And the mixes sound incredible. Uh, Mastering is just coming back. Things are getting pressed. And uh, everything from the album artwork to everything that's coming through is really top notch. It's gonna be really fun. Yeah. Right on. Well, again, people are fucking stoked, and I'm <laughs> glad there's a date and everything's happening. And uh, that'd be a good note for us to go out on. So we'll look for the new, still uh, yet untitled Lettuce record coming June 15th. Uh, Russ Elevato involved in the uh, engineering. And uh, we're here with Bo Williams. Uh, Lettuce's tour manager and more, we'll say, right? <laughs> or production manager, tour yeah, manager. TMPM, yeah. Right on TMPM. Well, it's uh, <laughs> we've had to dodge a few bullets back here. It's you know, lettuce is going on in like an hour and a half, and you were nice enough to give us twenty minutes while people ran in and out of your spot. So we wanted to do this for a while. Yeah, we had wanted to do it for a while. Yeah, well, I mean, it was a good idea because I think that your story is an inspiring one for just people who realize that you could just 
find something you dig and and go for it and surround yourself with the right people I mean, and chase it. You never stop. <laughs> I mean, you want to do something, do it. And you know, life's got an interesting path. Sometimes you got to let it like lead to. You know? <laughs> Wise words, my friend. So we're gonna sign off from Spirit of Swanee Music Park, Swanee Rising. I'll see you in New Orleans. Oh yeah. And uh, then at Ray Drops. So yeah. <laughs> Up for Life Podcast. B gets from Swanee Rising, and we'll see you next time. Yes, indeedy. want to say thank you to my man, Bo Williams, PMTM of Lettuce and a longtime friend. Also, large up to Ruben Sadowski, featured guest this week on episode 23 from Goyaki Urbamate. And we really appreciate both of those gentlemen's time. Uh, wrapping things up here. The Vibe Junkie Jam of the Week. We like to do it every episode. And uh, I had the pleasure of helping uh, Marillo release his new jam. So that track's called Booty. It's on his forthcoming album, Colibri, which is due on the 18th of October, right around the corner. But last week we rolled out the song Booty. It's fantastic. I heard it at Burning Man for the first time when he rocked Abraxas to its core on uh, the night of the man burn and I've been a fan of Murillo for a minute now I saw him perform back in the day at Bear Creek though I didn't know it was him he was a part of a sound duo which played uh, I think like 2009 or 10 and then uh, came upon homie at Symbiosis 2016 when he uh, tore down Silk Road uh, and the charred remains after Suhan had just set the whole place ablaze so, Marillo been on my radar ever since, and bringing you up to speed with the brand new single, Booty, which is on Gravitas Records, or Recordings, and check out the feature premiere on Live for Live Music by yours truly. And with that, I'm going to sign off for uh, episode 23 of the Up for Life podcast. I'm your host, B. Getz, and we'll see you next time. Yes, indeedy.
gotta find a slim chick.